Okay, welcome A Push students to Unit 5 Study Review. Uh, you have a 60 question test. I foresee it being pretty challenging for you guys. So uh, hopefully you use this study guide well. All right, let's jump in it. Results of industrialization following the Civil War. There are a lot of them. Um, a higher standard of living jumps off the page. That's certainly one of the first things that uh, is a result. Uh, you get a lot more immigration coming to uh, to the northern areas, and you get an, an increased output of goods, consumer goods, and uh, and raw products as well. And of course, anytime you have more production and stuff, you're going to be able to get to uh, lower prices. Uh, when it comes to factors that led to American economic growth. Um, at populate, our population is growing. That's a, a good tax base. That's a good work source. Uh, you have this huge market in America that's been growing since the market revolution. Uh, you also, in this time period, you have a lot of Republican presidencies that support uh, business growth, basically. Uh, you got a lot of westward settlement. You're, you know, the country is growing. All these things are going to help lead to uh, American economic growth in this period. And um, what were the effects of those Republican economic policies? Uh, you're going to see, because this is the Gilded Age, remember, you're going to see a rise in monopolies and in trust in these large corporations. Um, vertical integration is a process of that. And basically it's owning – you know, all the means of production, um, basically handling all of the functions there. Uh, Bessemer process, very simple thing that the Bessemer process is going to help still become better and more important and more valuable. Makes it better still, essentially. Uh, Montgomery Ward and Sears, what were they? Well, mail order catalog. Sears, Ro Sears Roebuck and Company was the famous mail order catalog. And it's incredibly important because farmers out in the countryside are going to be able to, you know, look at pictures of John Deere tractors and order them. And a couple of weeks later, their John Deere tractor is going to arrive and it kind of connects the country uh, to the cities and to the industries. Um, women in the workplace or workforce in the late 19th century. Um, in this time period, at least around the turn of the century, around 1900, uh, the vast majority of women are working as domestic servants. Um, there are, well, I say vast majority. There, there are a lot that are working as domestic servants, uh, teaching and nursing. Uh, those are going to be, uh, jobs relegated mostly for women. And of course, women are, are going to be working in the factories where they're getting paid less, um, Results of mass production. Uh, mass production kind of kills skilled workers. You have unskilled labor and you have skilled labor. Skilled laborers are craftsmen. They're people that can work with their hands and create uh, things that other people can't. Unskilled labor, anybody can do it. Think Ford factory turning the screws and attaching a steering wheel to a co steering column. Uh, so that's going to uh, – really hurt skilled workers for sure. Well, who were the new immigrants between 1880 and 1920? Um, and, and what about them? Um, a lot of these people were in their minds were only coming to America for a short time, always with the plan that they were going to go back home, uh, make some money while they're here and then eventually go back home. And while some did, obviously many of them ended up staying here in America. Uh, Granger laws, uh, think populism with, with the Grangers. It's a grassroots movement, um, but they want to regulate the railroads because the railroads have been treating farmers uh, very poorly uh, have not been giving them very good rates at all. So uh, most of the state Granger laws are in regarding in regards to the railroads. Um, asking about Victorian ideals of domesticity, uh, there's a lot there that, that ladies are supposed to be the moral influence. Um, that, you know, women have certain civic duties, uh, that men have to show restraint in how they treat women. Um, and but that you, you certainly have these spheres of influence, that there are things that men do and that there are things that women do. This is a kind of sort of this antique, outdated ideal that is going to be challenged in this time period that we're speaking of. Um, why did school attendance rise? 
Um, there are a lot of reasons why uh, you, you've got more businesses that need uh, more intelligent workers, so you've got to educate them better. Um, you know, daughters, you got to, you also got to think about the civil war and how many men it killed and you have a lot of widows and they're in, you know, they're basically going to start sending their daughters and getting their daughters in education because they need them to have one. Um, and probably the biggest thing I think is that eventually states begin passing mandatory laws that your kids are going to have to go to school. Um, so school is attendance is definitely going to rise and continue to rise as we go forward uh, in history. Our boy Booker T. Washington, um, you know, one of our favorites here, of course. Um, you know, remember that he was a former slave. Uh, he was an author of a book up from slavery. Um, he suffers criticism by people like W.E.B. Du Bois, who felt that he was too accommodating to whites. Uh, remember that he wants uh, blacks to work their way up to be happy with being janitors and low level positions that eventually white peoples will respect him. Um, you know, and of course, most famous probably for Tuskegee Institute there in Alabama. YMCA, Young Men's Christian Association. Um, kind of these things emerged because in the late 1800s, there was this rise in uh, muscular Christianity. Uh, this idea that as a Christian, you're, you kind of have a duty to take care of your body um, for sure. And yeah, it's really YMCA is going to be more for white collar workers. Uh, you don't have time for all that garbage. If you're working in the mines, you're doing this dirty blue collar work. Uh, a lot of sports came out in 1880s. Baseball was uh, big, of course. Uh, not 1880s, sorry, 1800s. Uh, baseball being one of the earliest ones. And right there around the turn of the century, of course, basketball comes around. Uh, 1860s, I believe, for football. Uh, but football is very controversial um, in the 1800s, uh, even to the point where Teddy Roosevelt had considered uh, banning football because of the amount of deaths that were associated with the sport. Uh, women's rights. And we know that it's not equal throughout the United States. Uh, that in certain areas, certainly in southern areas, women aren't going to have, um, you know, very many rights. But out west, because of women's importance there and how tough it is to make it in the geography, that out west women are actually going to get voting rights uh, well before 1920. Uh, what you know, think of effects of social Darwinism and and the role that it played. Um, there were many, remember, they said social justification for why the rich are rich and the poor are poor, uh, but it did come up with some kind of crazy ideas as well, uh, probably the craziest being eugenics, essentially the idea that people of low intelligence should not reproduce because by doing so, they are basically kind of dragging humanity down. Uh, so make sure you understand eugenics. Solitude of self, I hope you remember that term, um, that a woman can be self-reliant, that she doesn't have to rely on anyone else uh, outside of society. As far as in her home, remember, it's not talking anything about uh, public self, but basically that you can, you know, take care of business inside your home. Um, changes in the lives of middle-class American children in the last decades of the century. There are several. You have a rising standard of living from uh, factories and all that. But without a doubt, what I preach to you guys every day, education is by far the most important. That education is, is changing lives. Uh, many unmarried women missionaries, uh, by the turn of the 20th century, uh, they're going out and they are trying to be things that women had never been before. You know, and they're doing it on a foreign stage. However, remember, we're still in a fairly conservative time compared to today. Uh, so uh, pastors and ministers, women aren't really doing that out uh, in the international world because that's still really not accepted. Um, industrial impact on population growth in the United States. Um, you know, that we're getting bigger industries are growing and people are flocking to the cities uh great migration keep all those things into um, consideration when we talk about the growth of cities uh we are more and more cities as the years go by 
mass transit, remember, the idea behind mass transit was to solve the problem of urbanization, of urban sprawl. Um, and probably in 1900, the biggest way of solving mass transit was the trolley car. Thanks, San Francisco, famous for its trolley cars. Uh, obviously, eventually subways and stuff like that will really help out. But really, around the turn of the century, it's the trolley car more than anything else. Um, 1876, very important year for inventions. That's when Alexander Graham Bell invents the telephone, uh, which is a tremendously important invention that that – shrinks the country, shrinks the world by allowing instant communication uh, with families that live far off. Uh, skyscrapers, also another uh, invention to deal with uh, issues of urbanization. And skyscrapers aren't possible possible without better steel. Think Bessemer steel process. Uh, they got to have this new kind of glass that can be supported, you know, 30, 40, 50, 60 stories up. Uh, and you got to have elevators because people can't walk up 60 flights of stairs uh, all the time. Uh, that's going to get old real quick. Now, there are a lot of important American inventions in the late 19th century, in the late 1800s. Uh, you know, obviously we talked about Graham Bell's telephone and, you know, there's Samuel Morse a little bit earlier on with the telegraph, um, but electricity, Thomas Edison and others, uh, that is a game changer, uh, an extreme game changer. And it will change life in the cities. It's uh, obviously electricity is going to come to the cities a long time before it comes to the country. And it's a draw. It's uh, for people le wanting to leave the country for the bright lights of the city. I mean, that's what we're talking about. Uh, residential patterns in American cities around 1900. Um, very simple, that people are living next to people like them. You know, there's little Italy, there's little China. You know, there's all these, uh, resi you know, uh, basically segregated, self-segregated uh, by ethnic group. There's a lot of cheap amusements in these cities that are going to change um basically courtship rituals that there's more casual dating in the cities and that youth are going out without chaperones so the old school courtship rituals of i am going to ask for permission from the father and i'm courting this girl with with the assumption that at the end of the courtship there will be a marriage that's going bye bye that's being seen as an old style uh ritual uh, libraries. Uh, when you think of libraries in America, you got to think of one Andrew Carnegie, um, uh, Robert Barron, captain of industry, whatever you want to call him. Towards the end of his life, he certainly changes his opinions on things and he gives back and he's you know going to give his money not to his children, but to the people of America uh, through the building of libraries. Um, William Randolph Hearst and Joseph Pulitzer. These are our yellow journalism guys. Um, they have quite a bit of influence. Remember that they uh, help move us into the Spanish-American War. Uh, basically, they're competing to sell papers, so they're going to have very uh, sensationalist titles and sensationalized stories. Um, other journalists of the time of note were muckrakers, people like Upton Sinclair, uh, who wrote The Jungle. And what's the job of a muckraker? But to un expose the underside of American life, to show the truth to Americans so that they know. We had, um, uh, looks like I missed one on here. Uh, we did talk about Whole House, uh, remember Jane Adams, and Whole House did a lot of things. They offered a lot of things for uh, low income clients, for women. You know, they kindergarten and daycare, playgrounds, bathhouses for these immigrants who are trying to assimilate uh, into American culture. Triangle Shirtwaist Company fire, Factory Fire. Um, you know, we know what it was, but what is its effect? It's going to make the government of New York come down on businesses and make them pass better labor codes, you know, different rules that will protect workers because this was a subsidy of over 100 women dying, many of them young, and, and just people were sickened by it, and it made a change. Uh, this We also get into the progressive era in this time period that we studied. Um, and progressives, when you think of progressives, you got to think middle class urban reformers. Progressivism is a very middle class movement, whereas populism and, and some of the Granger stuff is a little bit more working class 
uh, movements. Uh, 1877 is the end of Reconstruction. And from that point on, you're going to see a lot of nobody presidents that most Americans don't remember. Many of them are one-term presidents. Um, and a lot of this is because the elections are close. It, the, the nation's not very divided. There's not as much difference, I suppose, between them. And so you get really close elections. And because the elections are close, the, the presidents don't have a mandate of the people. And so it's hard for them to get really a lot of stuff passed. Um, national politics in the Gilded Age, how would you describe them? Um, you uh, Corruption, for sure. Uh, it doesn't matter. Republican, Democrat, there's a lot of corruption. Uh, the presidents are, are weak, not very effective at all. Uh, now, there are a lot of, of Americans voting in this time period. It isn't like today. There are far more people voting in the time period. Uh, but all these elections are going to tend to be pretty close, and Congress is going to bounce back and forth. Uh, you get some important legislation passed in this time period, such as the Pendleton Act of 1883. Um, you know, it's basically a civil service exam. It says that for you to have a government job, you have to have uh, certain abilities that you can be held accountable to. Uh, so it's a pretty big one. It's it's. It's to help get away from um, corruption and scandal of, of the sport. Uh, I'm trying to pause this. Somebody knocked at my door. Well, okay. Um, let's see. Where was I? Da, 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 da. Okay. Uh, Sherman Antitrust Act. Uh, it's important because it's really the first law passed to regulate trust. Unfortunately, it ends up getting used against the unions more than it does the actual trust, but it does set a precedent uh, and it shows the people that, hey, uh, there's a problem here. Bus there's a problem with businesses and we've got to take a look at limiting their power. Uh, racial prejudice going on in the South in this time period. Um, people in the South, at least the people running the show, they're worried that poor whites and black people will get together with the populist party, that they will uh, – um, you know, that they will band together against the rich folk, and that would be terrible, of course. Um, let's see. Uh, William Jennings Bryan, remember him in the Cross of Gold speech that that in this case, uh, Bryan, who is running for president yet again, 0-3 for him, uh, he is trying to – he is supporting bimetallism. He wants silver – he wants money, American paper money, to be backed by silver as well as gold, which will help out the poor people and the farmers. Uh, and so he gives this famous cross of gold speech. Plessy versus Ferguson, very important, 1896. Very simple, separate but equal. It, it essentially allows for segregation in the South. Um, expansionist in this time period, um, there are a lot of them. Uh, Roosevelt's an expansionist, Alfred T. Mahon, who talks about sea power, William Seward, who uh, buys Alaska as Secretary of State under Abraham Lincoln, uh, Josiah Strong. Uh, all those guys are, they believe in expanding beyond manifest destiny. America's, the frontier is closed, but they're not ready to be done with that. Um, let's see, why, why the ideas behind expansionism? Uh, social Darwinism, we're better than other people. America is exceptional. Uh, that white Anglo-Saxon Protestants are better than other people. Um, and that we need overseas markets for the American economy to continue to be robust. Uh, very important. Uh, we talked about Alfred T. Mahon. Remember, he writes The Influence of Sea Power Upon History. He's going to help influence Teddy Roosevelt and uh, the building, the construction of the Great White Fleet. Um, Spanish American War, very important. There were several causes of the war. Remember the DeLone letter, making fun of President McKinley, the accidental sinking of the Maine, which wasn't seen as accidental at the time, uh, sensationalist journalism uh, that made us feel sympathy towards the Cubans, and we got to protect our sugar plantations down there. So there were a lot of reasons why we went to war uh, in Cuba. Now, what are some of the results? Uh, we get quite a bit. We get the island of Guam, the more important islands of the Philippines. Uh, Puerto Rico becomes an American territory, and we get influence in Cuba, so quite a bit from it. 
Uh, however, of course, the Filipino people are going to fight us in a guerrilla war immediately following this, and it's a far worse war than the Spanish-American War. Uh, they're fighting for their homes, of course, uh, and we're fighting on their turf. Um, Teddy Roosevelt's foreign policy. You got to remember that he is a uh, white man's burden guy, that it's a duty of the great countries to help those people who are second class and second world people. Uh, part of this as well in China, the open door notes, uh, Europe and America are on the verge of fighting over who gets control of all those Chinese people to buy their stuff. And so the open door notes basically says, hey, we need to share this pie instead of fighting over it. Uh, Panama Canal, very important with us. And remember, this is going to be us because we try to buy it from Colombia, they won't sell. So we encourage the Filipinos to, or the uh, Panamanians to um, rebel against them. And then we park some destroyers off the coast. And next thing you know, look at us. Uh, the Panamanians are leasing us the Panama Canal. Uh, let's take one more pause right here. Sorry about that. Um, operating in a very short amount of time. And I will be back shortly. Okay, uh, hopefully this is our last time right here. Uh, I'm running out of time on this, guy, so I'm going to have to rush through it just a little bit, okay? Um, very important. Make sure you know the reasons why America entered World War I and that it's just an enormous power shift. Remember that, that we emerged from World War I as an absolute superpower, for sure. Um, and more, and you know, of the three reasons that get us into World War I, you know, the Zimmerman telegram, uh, these loans that we don't want to lose our investments on. It's really the submarine attacks by the Germans that is the one that pushes us in more than anything else, really uh, angered the American people. You know what the Great Migration is, of course. That's uh, African Americans going from the South to the North for opportunities and jobs. Uh, the 14 points, um, you know, he, Woodrow Wilson's plan, he wants freedom of the seas, he wants the League of Nations, he wants a reduction of military arms, um, you know, he wants an end to colonization. Uh, let's see, uh, in the 1920s, I want you to remember that that is a, a time period of science versus religion. Uh, tradition versus a new modern ideas that are coming along. And you've got the city versus uh, the country way of life. Um, let's see. Palmer raids. Remember Mitchell Palmer raids? Uh, that's during the Red Scare. Uh, we're booting in doors of people. Um, and it is a gross attack on civil liberties for sure. Uh, Warren, Harding, Warren G. Harding, Republican president, super corrupt um, presidency and... Uh, he's involved in the Teapot Dome scandal. Make sure you know that. Uh, new KKK in the 1920s. Uh, it's not just going to be blacks. It's going to be Catholics and Jews and, and immigrants from the wrong countries. Um, let's see. Middle class consumer culture of the 20s. Radio is enormously big deal. If you're middle class, you're going to have that radio. You're going to have that car. Uh, you even get refrigerators and vacuum cleaners in this time period, which are very important to the middle class woman. Um, Great Depression, um, you get um, a lot of, uh, you, you know, 1929 with uh, the stock market crash, of course. You get all these bank failures. Uh, Herbert Hoover is the do-nothing president that doesn't really um, get us going anywhere. And last topic, uh, the flapper. And really the flapper is a, is a way of rebellion. For the women of the 1920s, they want to show that they can have short hair, short dresses, they can smoke, they can drink, that you can't basically stereotype them or label them. All right, guys, I know I got a little rush there at the end, but hopefully this will help you on what might be a difficult test. We shall see. Uh, good luck, and I'll see you tomorrow.